Today, we're going to talk about cellular replication and variation. Well, that's what it says on the uh, syllabus objective. If you wanted to summarize it in one word, effectively, what we're looking at is meiosis or meiosis, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, if we look at our syllabus objectives for this unit, just so we know what are we looking at, and this topic is going to be broken up across a couple of videos, we're going to start off first and foremost by looking at the process of meiosis. There's you know, not a lot here, um, but it all circulates around meiosis. So if you understand meiosis, then you're going to understand uh, basically how to answer most of these. Starting off with recognizing the role of homologous chromosomes. So what are homologous chromosomes or what do they do? And then we want to uh, later on look at the processes of crossing over recombination and how they contribute to creating genetic variation. I'm going to look at how um, sperm and uh, ova are produced, okay? And then also looking at independent assortment and random fertilization. So to put it simply, we're looking here at how meiosis contributes genetic variation and results in genetic variation in offspring through sexual reproduction. In terms of terminology, there is a fair bit of uh, jargon that you will need to understand for this topic, and we will explain it as we go through, but it's not a bad idea to, uh, I suppose, make sure that you are aware of um, these, these terms here, and there will be more throughout the video. First and foremost, um, sex or no sex? So when we're looking at reproduction of organisms, which is where we're sort of headed to, there's two ways that organisms can reproduce. There's asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. You will have learned about this in year 10 uh, and junior school as well. Asexual reproduction, quite simply, A in front of something tends to mean without. So it's reproduction without sex uh, and with only one parent. Because of this, uh, because we only have one parent, there's only one set of genetic material to choose from. So that means that the offspring, uh, or in the case of this occurring in your body cells, the um, daughter cells have exactly the same genetic code, same DNA, same genes as the parent. So this is how things like bacteria reproduce. This is how things like yeast reproduce. Simpler organisms uh, unicellular organisms typically are the ones reproducing via asexual reproduction. It can happen in other instances, but that's not in the syllabus, so we won't go through it now. In terms of what it, how it relates to us, generally these processes are occurring within our main body cells, which are known as somatic cells, so non-sex related cells. And it's how our body cells will reproduce through the process of mitosis. So when you have skin cells that are dying, you can make new skin cells via the process of mitosis. Sexual reproduction is our other form of reproduction, and that involves two parents um, having some sort of sexual intercourse, uh, sexual fertilization event. It in includes... Uh, two different sex cells or gametes, as we call them, from two different parents, uh, which means that half of the genes of the offspring come from each parent. That means that the offspring are going to be genetically different. Even if you just get randomly half your genes from your mother, half your genes from your father, that's going to create a completely genetically different organism in you than it would of your parents. Uh, there's actually a lot more variation than that as well, which we'll look at further on. The process of creating these sex cells that only have half the amount of, of DNA is known as meiosis. And that's the main thing we're going to be focusing on uh, throughout this topic. To start with though, mitosis. Mitosis, asexual reproduction of somatic or body cells. This is assumed prior knowledge for senior. Uh, you will have covered in some way, shape or form in junior. Um, so we're just going to refresh it now, basically. When you look at any given cell, it basically is out there living its life. And when it's doing that, it's during the it's living in the G1 part of interphase. You can see that mitosis is that little green wedge there. That makes up a very small part of a cell's actual life. As with, you know, most organisms, the reproduction 
uh, you know, most organisms aren't reproducing for the vast majority of their life. So if we look at that G1 phase, interval of cell growth before DNA replication, G1 is basically what these cells would call life. And some cells can stay within that G1 phase for very, very, very long periods of time. If the cell then decides to move at, past that, it, it wants to undergo uh, DNA replication, which is what mitosis is, then it will move into um, the S phase, which is when um, your, uh, your, your, your cell is starting to get ready for that DNA replication by um, condensing and duplicating the chromosomes. So DNA replication occurs and your chromosomes duplicated. And we learned about DNA replication just last week. After that G2, um, the cell prepares to divide and then we move into mitosis, which you can see demonstrated by this GIF on the side. All right, so in the G1 phase, the cell is just chilling, it starts to grow, it's making or replicating that DNA as it moves into the G2 phase, it begins to split. And then in mitosis, we have that replication. One common misconception, which realistically probably doesn't affect you too much, is that mitosis is a type of nuclear division or, um, or yeah, it's, it's creating a new nucleus. It's not necessarily the cell replication itself. It's specifically that section where the nucleus is um, being copied. All right, briefly going through the phases. Now, why do we need to know mitosis before we move into meiosis? Meiosis is effectively two spins of the mitosis cycle with a couple of adjustments. So what we see here in terms of our different phases is going to help us um, with, my, with meiosis because the phases are very similar. You may want to come up with a mnemonic to help you remember these phases, interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis. You'll be able to find some online, I'm sure. I always find that the mnemonics are much better when they're personal to you. Um, we were joking about this in one of my classes years back, and uh, we came up with a mnemonic that was related to one of, our, one of my students' uh, siblings. And it was Isaac Pearden makes a terrible coffee. Um, now that was silly and it didn't really mean anything to anybody else, but the entire class remembered it. So you need to come up with something for yourself. Uh, I-P-M-A-T-C to help you remember it. So looking now at those phases, interphase, we just look, talked about that briefly. That's where cells spend most of their life. The cell grows, it lives, it's happy. Uh, and then if it decides it's going to replicate, then it it will uh, replicate its DNA and get ready for mitosis. When we get to mitosis, okay, so we've moved from interphase G1 to interphase S, you can see that the DNA has duplicated there, uh, forming those characteristic X-shaped chromosomes that we know and love. And then we move from G2 into prophase. In prophase, we start to grow spindles or spindle fibers from the poles. And you can see those at the edges there looking sort of somewhat like little spiders. Those spindle fibers start to grow and stretch out towards the chromosomes. The nuclear membrane breaks down around the nucleus and the chromosomes can start to move around. They um, will start to migrate so that they can line up. Then we get into metaphase. In metaphase, uh, they line up at the equator. Meta is pretty pretty basic there in that they are just lining up at the equator, ready to be split. The In anaphase, the spindles attach to our chromosomes. The sister chromatids, which we know are the two sides of those duplicated chromosomes, and pull them apart. So one half goes to one side, the other half goes to the other side. And then in telophase, the spindles disappear nuclear membranes begin to form around our now duplicated chrome, uh, nuclei. So we have two nuclei there where we previously had one. Cytokinesis is not part of mitosis strictly. It's the phase immediately after, and that's when the cell splits into two, okay? So interphase, cell grows, DNA replicates. Prophase, the uh, nuclear membrane breaks down and the chromosomes get ready. Metaphase, they're lining up. Anaphase, they're pulled towards the poles, and in telophase, they're now at the poles, we form two new nuclear membranes. That's our process there. 
Having a look here at um, this summary diagram, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on it because it will make a lot more sense once you've gone through meiosis. But you can see that we have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase all within meiosis as well as mitosis. And the process is relatively the same. What is our purpose of meiosis though? Purpose of meiosis, it's a two-phase cell division. As I said, effectively two lots of mitosis, but we don't have two lots of DNA replication. The end result, instead of producing two daughter cells, which are diploid, meaning that they have a full set of 46 chromosomes. So that's what mitosis produces, two diploid daughter cells with full DNA. Meiosis produces four sex cells that are haploid, which means they have only one set of uh, 23 chromosomes. And this is occurring in your germline cells, your reproductive cells. The end result is that we have four daughter cells, gametes, which are either sperm or ova. Um, and there's a couple of extra complications there, which we'll talk about later on. Um, just some contextualizing of some terminology here, some of which you may have covered before. A gene, a particular section of a DNA. The main thing here uh, is that genes are found at a particular location known as the locus. They're found on a particular spot. Gene for a particular trait will always be found on the same chromosome in the same place. And that means that in different people, they will have that same gene in the same place, just a different version of it, alternate forms of it known as alleles, A-double-L-E-L-E. -L -E. Uh, the example there is eye color. Okay, let's say that the eye color is controlled by a single gene, then that would be found, let's say, on chromosome three at a particular spot. Everyone will have that gene at on chromosome three at that spot. The homologous chromosomes that we have in our cells, the purpose of them is that one of them carries the inherited genes and alleles from our mother, and the other carries the inherited genes and alleles from our father. Um, and that particular combination of alleles and genes is known as our genotype. So the homologous chromosomes are playing a really important role in genetic diversity of offspring because the presence of these different alleles um, means that you are genetically different to your parents. And that is all changed, the makeup of these as well, through processes like crossing over, which we'll cover after we've gone through the basics of meiosis. Um, effectively, though, with the, the processes we have in place with homologous chromosomes, that means that our offspring will never inherit the exact same chromosomes as their parents from these homologous chromosomes. Karyotype, we've already talked about in previous um, lessons. I'm not going to cover that in too much detail now. But we have our 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs all laid out here. We have our 22 autosomal chromosomes, and then our 23rd pair are our sex chromosomes. Autosomal, okay, similar root word to somatic. It just means non-sex related. All right, the process of meiosis now. The process of meiosis... Um, occurs within your sex organs. It's happening in the testes or in the ovaries. Um, and it's taking a diploid cell with a full amount of, of DNA and producing haploid cells. Okay, 2N for diploid and N for haploid. Um, this terminology holds true for any organism whenever they have, no matter how many chromosomes they have. For humans, N equals 23, so 2N, 46. But for an organism, say, such as a banana, which might only have 13 chromosomes, then N would be 13, 2N, 26. Uh, as it says there, the whole process involves two nuclear divisions of the parent cell, meiosis 1, meiosis 2, and DNA replication only occurs in the first interphase. So right before the first division even occurs. Meiosis 1 is called the reduction division because at this stage we produce daughter cells with half the chromosome number. Um, so the end result is that we end up with two daughter cells, but they only have half the amount of chromosomes that they're meant to. We'll go through how that process happens. But we've had interphase, DNA is replicated, 
everything's normal. At this point, it's basically mitosis. We get to prophase one where the chromosomes are condensed, become visible, and they line up the homologous pairs um, and all that duplicated X-shaped chromosomes now. At this point, when they're lined up during this process or during this, sorry, pairing up, um, they can get a little too up close and personal and they can coil around each other. When they coil around each other, they are effectively end up swapping some genes. So as it says here, they coil around each other, forming um, a contact. Um, when they coil it up, they're known as a tetrad 4N because they've now got four times the amount of um, DNA or 2C, meaning two chromosomes. And at this point, it's called the points at which they meet is called a chiasmata. Those chiasmatas are important um, because those chiasmatas are effectively where crossing over occurs. At the end of pro, uh, at the end of prophase one, uh, the nuclear membrane breaks down. Okay, and we start to move into our other phases. Metaphase one, the homologous chromosomes line up on the equator, still attached at that chiasmata, and the spindle fiber attaches to them. Now that's exactly the same as in uh, metaphase in mitosis. In anaphase one, the maternal and paternal chromosomes are pulled towards the poles. However, the sister chromatids stay attached. So in mitosis, what we were looking at is the sister chromatids being pulled apart. Okay, I might go back in terms of slides to show you that in our meiosis diagram. So if you'll notice in this diagram here, in anaphase one, all right, you can see that we've got two sister chromatids on the left uh, with the sort of orangey red color, okay? And those homologous chromosomes are being um, pulled apart. But when we're looking at meiosis, that's not what happens here. So the um, sister chromatids, sorry, sister chromatids I meant to say before, in terms of homologous chromosomes. So the sister chromatids, instead of being pulled apart, we have two copies of that one chromosome. Now they stay attached. And one will move, one set of sister chromatids will move to one side and then the other sister chromatids or other uh, duplicated chromosome will move to the other. So you end up with mum's DNA on one side, dad's DNA on one side, and that process is completely random and independent. You'll see in these diagrams here, we've got our red and our blue, which is stereotypically meant to represent you know, our mothers and fathers, etc. cetera. Um, and you can see that not all the reds go to one side and all the blues go to the other side. So this is our first opportunity to make some genetic variation here in that when these are pulled apart, uh, you don't end up, well, at the end of um, meiosis here, we don't end up with one cell being entirely made up of daddy's DNA and one made up of mummy's DNA. So that's our um, independent assortment there, which we will discuss further. For now, the main thing you need to know is that we're going through mostly mitosis, except for the sister chromatids will stay attached to each other. Uh, in telophase one, to wrap it up, we see the chromosomes at the poles as two sister chromatids not a pair of homologous chromosomes, which is what we normally expect. The spindle fiber breaks down, uh, we end up with two nuclear envelopes, and we've now got two new haploid daughter cells, okay? So what we've done here is reduce the amount of chromosomes in the, um, reduce the amount of different chromosomes in the two cells. After we have a very short interphase two, it doesn't need to be long because the cell's not growing, it doesn't need to replicate its DNA, we move straight into our process known as meiosis two. In prophase and metaphase two, the spindle forms, chromosomes line up along the equator, same as before. In anaphase two, the sister chromatids separate and move to opposite poles. Each chromatid now becomes the chromosome of the daughter cell. Okay, so, um, we end up at the end of this four daughter cells and those sis those sister chromatids, as they get separated, that becomes the DNA of those daughter cells. Telophase and cytokinesis, we end up with four haploid cells as the cells split. Um, female ovum will have 22 autosomes. Um, 
sorry, females produce ovum, I should say, not female ovum, they're all female. Uh, females produce ovum with 22 autosomes and an X chromosome regardless, because females are XX. So all of their ovum are gonna have that makeup. Males will produce 22 autosomes with then either an X or a Y. So when it comes down to determining the biological uh, sex of a uh, embryo, then that comes down to the male because the female can only ever contribute an X, whereas the male can contribute an X or a Y, okay? So the father is responsible for the biological genetic sex. This is a process represented here of meiosis II. Uh, it probably looks much, much the same as any other diagram that you've looked at. There are lots of great summary diagrams out there and I really do suggest that you go and um, check them out because it will help make the process a little uh, clearer for you, I believe. Okay, if we just skip forward a little bit here, this is showing us our meiosis process here. It's not cyclical like mitosis. It has an end result. Those gametes go off and, and do their own things at the end of it. But you can see here the process of the sister chromatids not separating. You can see the chiasmata and the crossing over process forming. Um, so you can see the entire process going on. Okay. All right. So hopefully that helps. We'll go through crossing over and stuff in the next video. I will see you then.